Coming to you from the world of AV programming, control, and automation with James King. I'm Steve Greenblatt, and this is Ask the Programmer. Hi, James. It's good to be back with you. Hey, Steve. It's great being back. Uh, these are fun. Always love catching up. Same here. I think the, they're, they're becoming a, almost a, a good way for us to, to, to really have that water cooler talk that, that people are missing these days. Uh, I, I know that we, we've gotten a little bit of, uh, of feedback from people that are listening and uh, I'll let you share a couple of things that, that you heard. Yeah, um, really, the, probably the latest one we want to give a shout out to is Eric Bernhardt. Um, he gave us a comment on, let's see, it was episode or late, uh, episode five where we've got talking about training about AV programming and Eric, great points there. Um, and as we keep saying is you gotta always be programming. You gotta, you gotta actually have your hands dirty and actually doing it. Um, so good points there that not just going and getting the training, but you also gotta gain education on doing it by physically programming. Yeah, I th think one of the things that he pointed out was that when you're, if you're just solely relying on manufacturers to to give you your training, they're they're not necessarily teaching you always the fundamentals that you need for any type of programming, but more so what what works for them and and their products and and uh, it, it it's unfortunately it it isn't that foundation. You still need that foundation from somewhere. Yeah, man nothing against manufacturer training um because i understand purpose behind them but like we were talking before we hit recording kind of throws you into a pigeon toad throws you into a box um and you only know those certain areas kind of got blinders on as we mentioned our last episodes you got to branch out got to learn different ways of doing things because just because you're doing it one way doesn't mean it's the right way so that, that would give us a good good little segue talking about right ways. And we're, we're going to use this episode to, to cover a little bit of best practices. And one of those things that touches every programmer is, is ha how do you manage your source code? And it's not about source code ownership per se, but it's more so about um, being responsible for having uh, a, a good source code policies and and being able to write code so that other people can take it over, or that uh, you're you're also knowing that what you're that that you even you yourself can go back to your old code and know where you left off. Because one of the things that I learned in the very beginning of what I uh, of what uh, my career and and uh, what what AV is all about is that AV systems are never done. So. You, you don't write code and, and just put it away and it, it never gets touched again. It's very rare. So uh, I think the idea that there needs to be every organization or every programmer needs to have a way to be able to manage your source code. And depending on, on um, where you are and who you work with and work for, that may be defined for you. But uh, there are definitely some things that programmers need to be very cautious about. So, um, James, uh, what what um, what what experiences can you share in this area, and, and um, whether it's some some good or bad experiences? I would probably say mine are more bad experience. Um, so, I'm looking forward to see what tips you have as well as our listeners uh definitely give us your tips uh for source code management i as we mentioned before programmers are kind of a person on an island i felt that way a lot um starting to get out of that a little more with building this community with steve and some other programmers i've been communicating with but my source code management is poor and getting better. It was used to be non-existent. And then I realized this is not the right way of doing things. And I've been trying a couple of things here and there. Um, the first thing I would do, the first thing I did was I would um, 
once I push the code to a room, I would then export that code, code stamp it, and put it into a repository that anyone in our staff could gain access to, which is great because it has timestamp of when it was uh, developed and all that stuff, but you got to be active on that. And there's sometimes it's like, oh, wait, this button didn't do this. I had to go fix it, sent it, fixed the room, but never updated the repository with the latest, um, which would be bad source code management because now they're, my room is running newer source code. And if my coworker goes, oh, there's a problem here, go just grab the one from the repository and push it out, it's going to be a broken code because I didn't put the right stuff into it. So I've fixed that. Um, what I'm doing now is being more proactive and making sure I export the code. But then I'm also, anytime I do push code, I, I'm putting a timestamp in my comment section of this is when I pushed it. And then I'm also putting in last time I edit the code because there might be a time I edit the code, but I wasn't ready to push it yet. So now I know, okay, I edited this two weeks ago. Let me see what I've changed and stuff like that. So I, I could very much relate on so many levels and, and, it, and you learn from experience. It's one of the things that I've, I've gotten out of what we do and, and you, you create your habits and, and, that, and the more you realize that, I think the more work you do, the more you realize that you have to, to be responsible for, for coming up with some type of an organization system. And not everybody needs to use a, um, a GitHub or, or some type of a, a software uh, archival system, but those are very helpful. And, and my team happens to, to go, go that route now where, where they check in and check out code and, and there's uh, a, a history that, that's kept. And, and I'm very thankful of that because I, I, they, we have multiple people working on multiple things and we also have a responsibility to our clients. And, and so, so that's, that's one way that I would say can, can be ideal, but not, not necessarily um, always needed for everyone. What, what I did, even when I was working on my own, is just made sure that I was keeping revisions. I would sometimes, even through a development process, change a revision number, create a backup, keep a, a log so that I had a history and a paper trail because and I'm sure that you could relate to this, is that you, you hate to have that corrupt file and it's your only copy. So oh, yeah. We've all gone through it, and that's when you learn and you get burned. Um, so I, th that's one example of why you have to have a, uh, a some type of a maintenance system. I can definitely agree. I think we all, you know, put our hands on a uh, hot stove once in a while to learn that the stove is hot. Um, I'm sure we all push code out that is broken code or bad code. Um, so yes, having those documentation and that goes to being very organized, as you mentioned, I think episode one of being as a program, being very organized and documenting because sometimes I don't know about you, but especially with me in higher ed, where I do wear many hats, sometimes it's like, okay, I need to add this button get it done because the class is starting 10 minutes um so i may not take that time to actually doc document it but then it's a year later if i'm looking at that code i'll be like why is this here um so it's definitely important to make sure you're documenting everything and that's something i'm learning daily about so one of, one of the, to, to your point there, one of the things that I think is really an important thing for others to understand too. So whether it's an integrator that is working with programmers that they have on their team or, or an end user client who has 
who, who wants to make sure that they have the code for their own systems is to know that the code, know what, know what they have and know what they have is accurate and make sure that it's being kept up to date, as you said, because it, one of the one things, and, and I, I find this happens a lot is you, you get a false sense of security because you say, I have the code and I put it somewhere, but I don't know, but I've never looked at it. I, and, and for all you know, is when you go to, to use it, you open it up and it's not even the uncompiled code. So there, there, there's really a, an important education that needs to happen there to, to really understand, yes, I got everything I need. It is the latest and almost you test it to make sure that if I load this, this is what actually exists in my system. On the flip side, I would also say too, is anytime that there's a service call or maintenance, that code needs to be updated because you think you have the code, but now you don't have the latest code. And, and that's one of the biggest burners that I, we've ever, that we encounter all the time is modifying code that may not be the latest. Yeah, and that probably adds a lot of time management to your team because if you had the right code at the right time an update process probably would take you know five ten minutes but now if you're working with bad code not only you are wasting the time of pushing that code and then you're like okay now i need to fix this and you're under the gun so your five to ten minute upgrade your patch is now turning into a day job you're there all day. Quite honestly, that's what makes programmers look bad. So the, the, one of the reasons I think that we should have this conversation is, is that we need to take responsibility because these are some of the ways that we have this asset and, and it's important that we treat it that like, like it is, this is, this is what we've created, even though it doesn't really mean a lot to a lot of people. Uh, but it needs to be treated like it's really of utmost importance and and it needs to you need to understand what it is that you have yes and i think probably went back in the past of job security so program if uh, you know if i was writing the code and i'm the only one who had the source code and i'm the only one who understands the layout of the source code i can't go anywhere you know because the company is going to be you know, up the uh, river route paddle. I don't buy that anymore. Um, the way I kind of look at it is the second you think you're more valuable to the company than the company, that's when you're packing your bags and leaving. I truly feel everyone's replaceable from a janitor all the way up to the CEO of the company. Everyone's replaceable. Um, a, some people are a little harder to replace than others. Uh, but everyone is replaceable. So it's not about hoarding the code and protecting it. So you still have a job. It's sharing and being a teammate uh, member and building that community that we're talking about. So you keep a job. And you never know too, when you're going to have somebody who comes on your staff that you're going to need to share with. And it could be kind of embarrassing if you're, if, if, the practices that you had were specific to you and they have to, you now have to open up the kimono and show them what, what you've been doing. Yeah. That I, I used to use this analogy about talking to a student worker when we were talking about wiring uh, AV racks. And I guess you can apply it to your code and stuff to that. Think about it as the person coming behind you to maintain what you did is this crazy serial killer who will track you down and kill you if you frustrate them can 99% of the chance you're the one going back and cleaning it up so just like on Iraq I always made sure our student workers knew how to wire it correctly so that we can service them same thing with code document everything and revision everything make sure you have the latest so that you're not causing frustration to your own self down the line. 
I, I, I think that that's a w wonderful tip. And I really like the way you put that in and that hopefully worked out well for, for you and that student worker. I think that that's a good life lesson. Yep. I agree. So I wonder if there's some other uh, tips that we can get from those who are listening. If anybody can share uh, some of the best practices that they use, what, what do you, how do you manage your code? Um, or do you do things that are individual? Do you do things that are more on a team level? Uh, how, how do you hand over your code? Uh, what, what are some of the things that you found to be successful? And even if you want to share a few horror stories to, uh, to, to help uh, cre create some familiarity and, and um, relatability, uh, we, we, we'd accept that too. So please, please reach out and let, let us know. And uh, we, we, think that this is an important conversation and it's going to help to elevate the game for all programmers. Uh, James, how could people get in touch with you if they want to uh, reach out and continue the conversation? Um, again, people have already been reaching out, so I'm assuming they know how to get a hold of me. But as always, my ha Twitter handle is uh, AV underscore James King. I'm on LinkedIn, James King, or you can swing by higheredav.com and check out my monthly article, IT in AV column. And we re recently talked about one of James' articles, so make sure you check that out and they come out every month. Uh, for me, you can reach me simply at Steve Greenblatt on all social media, and uh, we'd like to hear from you. So please uh, let us know what you think, and we really appreciate the feedback we've been getting. And uh, if you would be so kind and feel like what we're doing is worthwhile, uh, leave us a rating, a review. Those would mean the world to us. So until next time, this has been Ask the Programmer.